in there. Still have like FFA and all that stuff, but I don't know. I know the UVA baseball team was up there before their season started. You know how they have that like two week thing? They come up for like three days. Yeah, so I haven't seen Donald in a while. Stab or something? Blue Ridge. I knew it was a private school, but I couldn't remember which one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty good too. Some of the coaches. Or somebody told me it was still going pretty good. Yep, I probably met you at one time then. Nice to meet you again. Three days in. Pig? No. I already have a pet pig.
have it in your phone since mm-hmm. you've been on. I need a vacation too. I'll go fishing. <laughs> Wake up at three o'clock in the morning. Every day. Hi, Mark. How are you doing? Uh, yeah, I looked through most of them. So look, still using it, disconnected from it. So. <laughs> All right, we got everybody. Randy's not here. Where's Matt? I know. I I don't like sitting back that long. <laughs> Okay, we all ready? Huh? Got everybody here, yeah. except for Danny. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't get packed, but I probably need to. Okay, it's a little after 6.30. I think we've got everybody about ready to begin. Uh, we do have a quorum present. All commission members are here except for Danny Krigler. We do need to uh, take a quick look at the agenda, see if we need to make any alterations or if we can just go ahead straight with that. I recommend we accept the agenda as presented. Second. Okay. Motion is made and seconded to uh, go with the agenda as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We need to take a quick look at the minutes from the June 7th joint meeting. See if we also need to make any corrections or changes. Make the motion that we approve the minutes as they are. Second. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, motion has been made and seconded. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? With uh, Pete Elliott abstaining. Very good. <clears throat> all right. We have. Three cases plus some previews. Uh, as always, each case will be read. Um, Regan will give us any updates. Uh, if the applicant has wishes to address the Planning Commission, they'll have a chance to do that. And uh, after that, if there's any public comment on each case, there'll be time for public comment. <coughs> case number. SU-07-23-11, Mr. Troy Weaver has applied for a special use permit to operate an automotive repair shop on a 4.78 acre parcel which he owns. The subject parcel is zoned A1 agriculture and in this zoning district an automotive repair shop is allowable by special use permit. If approved, the applicant would construct a 60 by 60 metal framed building containing 
3,600 square feet of interior floor area. This building would also contain a bathroom. The subject undeveloped parcel does not currently have a postal address, <clears throat> but is located on Shelby Road, Route 662, which is identified on Madison County's tax maps as 55-42A. Right, Megan, anything to add to that information? Uh, yeah, uh, here's the, if you have not familiar with the parcel, here on Shelby Road, about exactly half a mile from the intersection of Shelby Road and 29. Uh, I've been discussing this with Mr. Weaver for several months now. Uh, if you look in your packet, uh, you will see, um, and I'll just put this on satellite Im image, and you can just see that there's an existing driveway here, and this is just shared with, a, a, I believe I'm correct, just this house in the, in the rear here. It's a shared driveway, previous owner of this parcel. Uh, I think when Mr. Weaver bought it several years ago, deeded it uh, right away, uh, that you can see kind of follows pretty close. It's a little closer here to this edge and juts out uh, to the back here. Um, uh, one of the items that we looked at was potentially in VDOT. Uh, you can see in the correspondence, they just, I mean, there's good sight distance here. Uh, they would prefer, uh, they had no issue if this was moved just kind of somewhere right in here, a dedicated entrance uh, for uh, this this particular this proposed garage, auto body shop. Uh, <clears throat> looking at the traffic, which are, you know obviously is a is a, a big issue. Um, you have about 720 daily trips on Shelby Road, so uh, appropriately used rural uh, road. 79 trips is the peak hour, any 24 hour period. Uh, VDOT traffic counts uh, show 79 trips as the highest one hour. Uh, trying to estimate the traffic from a shop this size. Institute of Traffic Engineers, I was able to find, estimate about, uh, estimate the peak hour traffic to be about, between, I would say between 20 and 25 day, uh, would be the peak hour. You'd have more during the whole day. I, I think that's kind of high for this type of operation, for a body shop, maybe for an automotive shop this size. Um, also, another another uh, item just want to point out is that the applicant has submitted. Uh, we did submit all the documents to VDH for the drain field. And if you look on the, the sketch that I provided in your packet, I'll just go down here to it real quick. You can see where the roughly where the drain field is located. And I'll just go down here. And this area right here, this is the area of the proposed garage. And as you can see here, this would be uh, roughly where the entrance would be located. Low volume commercial entrance is really just just a wider entrance. Um, on the conditions, it shall run with the applicant. If it was to be sold, we'd have to come in and have a new hearing. I, I put one garage structure. That's that's the only structure uh, that is planned for the site. I did put it 65 by 65. That just being that I have sometimes found, again, if this is approved, I have sometimes found that it, it could possibly be a little bit larger, 61. But I mean, it's 60 by 60, but in case it is, that's why I built in just a little bit of margin of error. Uh, as you can see, another condition is that the parcel would be would be developed uh, in the manner which essentially which it's shown here. I uh, also a condition before we get a building permit. It is pretty well screened right now is to enhance this buffer where if you're coming in here, there is an entrance about where this I'm showing right here, but this would not be used. This could, this would be some, you know, blocked off, uh, and we would just do a vegetative buffer, uh, increase that uh, plantings, some evergreens, Leland cypress, uh, to really create a wall there. And on this other side, on the, uh, I guess that would be the west side. And I think one of the 
the most significant, uh, I guess, conditions would be no more than six cars would be parked in this gravel parking area um, overnight. So there might be some employees there during the day, but is this facility, Mr. Weaver explained to me, most of his vehicles would be parked inside. Also, I did talk to Jamie, building official, you know, if there are painting cars, uh, this does require a ventilation system, uh, fire suppression system. That's just standard building permit for a for an operation like this. That's just standard things for building permits. So didn't put it as a condition, but again, that's just something you just have to do. Um, otherwise, um, that's that's kind of all I have right now as a as a quick overview. So any questions for me? Any questions for Leland on this? Hey, Lee. So uh, if we're going to limit this to six vehicles and it's a, a body repair shop, I've, I've seen body repair shops. They may have vehicles, but they're just parked, scattered out, you know, and I've seen a lot of truck barrels in this area. And we could also go in a R1 area. Is there anything we can say about awesome. that? Yeah, I think it's, there's really no, no uh, problem with just adding that as well. That in any body parts, right? Would would, would also, right? I mean, I, talk, talking to Mr. Weaver, I mean, he intends on keeping the site totally uh, uh, in order and clean. So I don't think adding that is is an issue at all. If we, we could definitely add that. Uh, kind of a picky question here. Um, in the, uh, what was, uh, given to the public as far as this application, it said it was a metal frame building, and over in here, you, you describe it as a pole building. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not feeling fish, but I think it's, they're kind of interchange, interchanging. It has a, has, has a metal frame, uh, which sometimes, I guess, are also called poles buildings, but... Yeah. No. Right. Um, right. But the structure is wooden poles with uh, purlins. So, well, I guess we can ask the applicant, I guess. Is he right. here tonight? Is the applicant here mm -hmm. tonight? Okay, we'll, we'll ask him when, when we get there. Any other questions for Lee? Where's the uh, where's the business now? Yeah, I he, see the numbers on here. He's done X amount. Of yeah, he, he he can tell you where that got okay. back down to us. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Uh, for Legan, then um, this proposed building is. You've got a 100-foot front setback, then you've got the gravel parking area, and then immediately behind that you have the building. Is that correct? That's right. All right, and the existing, well, actually, from that diagram, the existing driveway doesn't actually enter from this property. It enters slightly to the side and then goes into it. Is that correct? Yeah, so this would be the proposed entrance right in this area right here? Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the existing that road that went back to the uh, adjoining property, that's... That wouldn't be used. That would be changed so that there's not an entrance there? Yeah, I, you can look at, I think I got some pictures. There, I mean, the entrance would stay there, but the, the business would not, uh, as you can see, right here. Here is the, here's the entrance right here. There are actually two side by side. Uh, so the entrance is just right. Yeah, I should have got a picture of the entrance, but it's just right here. So it would not be utilized. Okay. So the, yeah, actually, that that the aerial view shows two entrances. Right? Yeah, there, there's one right here. They're, it's they're separate. They're two separate entrances. But so they're going to close off that particular one right. Not going to close it off. Just going to buffer it through here, and and this operation would not use that to get on. That would I mean, be in the fifty foot building setback. Right. Mm -hmm. If you go by it, it just stays yeah. gravel rather than go to the deep end of the building. Okay. 
No, so yeah, that, this is where the existing entrance is. So right here, and the, the 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 new entrance would be here. So he would block this off. Now he might not put trees right here, but it, just some sort of barrier, and then this would all be enhanced buffer. So uh, basically, what I'm leading up to is you're you're going to retain that entrance. You're just not using it for the business, but then the business is going to have an additional entrance. Uh, is that meeting the the distance requirements between the entrances? I mean, if you're not totally fine with it, I, I mean, with that with that that's entrance being there. To, if I remember correctly, that's 400 feet on. I, I, that's, is that on 29 or something like that? So I mean, nine, there's nine, 900 feet on 29. Yeah, so is that? It's like 600 feet. On secondary. Okay. Okay. I mean, you got these two inches just that are side by side, but I mean, there's, you know, house entrances all up and down, but there's very good sight distance um, on this road. Okay, any other questions for Lisa? All right, for the applicant then, would you like to say anything ahead of time? <laughs> I think I'm good. Um, yeah. You know, I've been working on it for a little while and I just kind of know what I need to do. I think I got all the requirements that I need to meet to mm -hmm. actually do it with. So just got a couple more things I need to touch bases with, and I think that should be about it. Okay. Uh, well, I had that original question. Uh, would you describe the proposed building a little bit better? Is it? Um, it's a metal building. It's, a, it's going to be a steel, steel building. Steel building. Okay. So it's not a pole structure then. No, sir. Okay. Um, the question was raised about the paint booth, uh, I assume that there's all kinds of regulations that you have to operate under to deal with a automotive paint booth. Exactly. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have had some interactions with people trying to do automotive painting before and Many times they just quit because of the regulations that are required on them. So. I got a, um, basically I have like a down drive paint booth that I bought. Mm -hmm. So it's got everything in there that any normal body shop would normally have. <coughs> it's got all the, you know, systems for anything that's going on. So, I mean, I've been doing it for like, 22 years plus, and I kind of just kind of know my way around the system already. Mm -hmm. So that, that should hopefully alleviate some questions about the potential uh, emissions of in the air, particular emissions and things like that. I suspect there, you're not allowed to have any particular emissions in the air, I would guess. Right. Yeah. Any other, any questions? Well, we're not rezoning it. It's just a, it's a special use permit, so it stays agriculture. Uh, you know, he talked about building a house on it. I mean, maybe one day in the future he could try to rezone the front of it. But uh, he, I mean, he can tell me, but he said that's really no time in the near future. Uh, so uh, it, it's very well that this parcel would just be developed in this in this fashion. But it, but it's it's a special use, so it stays agriculture. <clears throat> and this is. What, maybe half a mile from 29? It's, it's, it's exactly it's, half a mile. It's well within the 29 corridor or so for business. Mr. Chairman, I, I got one. Yeah. I just, Mr. Weaver, you know, you've got only got 4.78 acres, right? And we do have three acres per use in ag zone. So um, if you put this building in, you would not be able to uh, build a residence on that same property at a later date. Do you, I just want to make do you realize that. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, sir. In that case, uh, any public comment on this application? Yes, ma'am. If you would come to one of the mics uh, and identify yourself, and then give us a hopefully brief comments. 
Hi, my name is Sharon Mallory. I'm the owner of the parcel that shares that will be sharing that long driveway. Mm -hmm. um, I've also spoken with several of my neighbors that border this lot, um, and there should be in the packet a letter along with signatures where we are all in opposed to this due to the volume of extra traffic and noise, along with the concerns about the pollution in the air as well as the well and the water system. So we are all, you know, we have concern. These are our concerns. Um, I was the only one that received a written notice today. I spoke with my other neighbors. They said they didn't get it in the mail. So this was a last minute for me. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit unprepared other than what's already been written. Um, but we are just not in agreement with a business being developed in what's already an established residential area. Just for the sake of the noise, the extra volume and the possible pollution to the air. And I don't know what it would do to the water if something seeped into the ground. So those are our concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As well as my access being blocked, that was one of my other concerns. Um, that's my only entrance in and out. Mm -hmm. And that was deeded when I purchased the property 20 years ago, that I would have right away to get back to my property. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. Do you have any additional questions or discussion from the Planning Commission? Okay. Uh, the second case tonight is case number RZ-07-23-12. Louth Callan Renewables has applied to rezone a 91.8 acre split zone B1 business and A1 agriculture parcel to develop a solar farm, aka commercial solar energy facility. The subject parcel contains a roughly 11.6 acre portion along the entire frontage with US-29, which is zone B1 and the balance of the parcel is zoned A1 agriculture. The request is to rezone the entire parcel to M1 limited industrial with conditions, M1-C. The applicant has submitted a rezoning condition that would eliminate all by right M1 uses from future consideration unless a subsequent public hearing is held for their inclusion. The subject 91.8 acre parcel does not contain a postal address, but is located on South Seminole Trail, US 29, and adjoins the parcel where Yoder's Country Market is located. In addition, the parcel is identified on Madison County's tax maps as 48-12C. Regan, anything to add there? Um, sure. So this, I know, I know we've, talked about this place in here for a couple of years and we have staff uh, uh, Jonathan Sean Ann, and myself uh, among others have been working with the applicant uh, to come up with the, the various agreements uh, to put forth uh, for the plan commission and the board as they consider this uh, as I emailed today I think some have a hard copy uh, we have there, there are three elements to this uh, of course, first is, you know, we have a rezoning application. Part of that rezoning application is a proper, uh, that if, if it's rezoned from A1 and B1 to M1, that they would eliminate all by right uses. And that letter is forthcoming, but you can see the language is in the actual packet, uh, the siting agreement. Uh, the second part is if if it is rezoned, the second part would be a special use permit uh, that they would apply for. Uh, you know, after one hearing, it would be, be the second hearing. The special use permit conditions that are proposed, and we borrow a lot heavily from different communities, and I know Supervisor uh, uh, you know, Jewett's in a nice summary of, of some other uh, nearby solar agreements. We've looked at ones in Louisa. We've used one from Sussex County, Charlotte County. Uh, so we. I think I put together a pretty good uh, uh, package of conditions, uh, 
siting agreement based on what other communities have, have utilized. If you look at the special use conditions, they are here as Exhibit B. Uh, and then the last item, rezoning uh, the special use condition, is the actual siting agreement. Uh, this goes into, you know, we had all the questions before, decommissioning, uh, you know, uh, there's a whole host of things that were posted on the, on the website. Uh, you can, I know we had previously uh, had asked for, and we have, you know, just kind of show you the decommissioning plan. Uh, we have the, let me just, this is the, I think this is the visuals. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the landscaping plan for the site. Um, then we have feasibility study. I'll just keep opening these up. Um, the impact study. The economic impact. And then this is the actual. I believe the last one would be the <clears throat> would be the Yak view shed. So, so signing agreement. I won't go through it all. If Hannah wants to add something, we've been working on. We feel like uh, I sent an email out today. I think most of y'all might have gotten. I think we're about ninety five percent done. Uh, there's a few tweaks here and there we need to do. Uh, one of the big parts of this, obviously, is the revenue. Uh, I have sort of calculated uh, they're offering a $100,000 capital payment for the 45-year term. Just to sort of show you right here, that's 45-year. It's pretty basic math here. But we're also utilizing the revenue-sharing model. Uh, that could be increased by 10% every five years starting in 2026. Uh, so you can see here, this is 10 years, this is 10 years, this is what the total collection. This is not also not including uh, land, the, the property tax, which is right at, at, at the assessment, if this is a rezone, probably looking at between eight and $10,000 a year, just in property taxes. So using this model, the only thing that I need to change that's in here, it's in the hard copy, is the last two years are actually 52,814. I had a six year, 48. So you can see this would be the revenue sharing. You know, here's um, revenue sharing at 20 years. Here's 10 years. I'm sorry, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and then I think this is 40, and then the life of the project, 40, then the 45 years. Total uh, after 45 years. J just for a little bit of perspective on revenues, uh, just looking at different assessments, you know, you're looking at first year <clears throat> revenues somewhere around one, I'd say about 130-ish, if you add the land tax in here, 100,000 plus the revenue. Um, one of our largest industrial properties uh, in the county, and does that include machining and tools tax? So that would not be on the table here, but one of our larger industrial properties pays about 110 in property tax, $110,000 a year, and that's the building and land. So just to kind of give you an idea, it would it would definitely be one of the higher revenue producing properties. Um, other than that, uh, you know, siting agreement, proffer, you had some time to maybe look at, I know not a lot of time, but some time to look at the agreement. And of course, once it's finalized, I will go ahead and just, we, we will go ahead and, and distribute that. I don't think it's gonna be much different than what it is now, but once it's, once it's completely done, we'll send it out, whether it's this Friday or early next week, so everyone will have plenty of time to, to look at it and ask any questions. Uh, so other than that, I don't have a lot more to add. Um, Hannah, do you have anything or anybody want to jump in here? Or? I'll, just, I'll just address the siting agreement briefly. And maybe it speaks to the larger project itself, but the siting agreement, I think the real decision points here are revenues and then risk uh, for the county. Um, so the revenue share ordinances what it is in terms of it's tied to the uh, megawatts. There's, there's no real wiggle room there. Um, $100,000 capital payment. Um, we're seeing if that's potentially can be increased. I think 
that's one of the discussions here. Um, I think the last 5% here is, is going to be the hardest in terms of trying to nail down an agreement. Um, in terms of risk, there's risks sort of, um, I mean, everywhere in terms of, all right, what happens if these things leak? Um, if there's water contamination, then we're trying to address these things. You know, you've got erosion possibilities. You've got, um, you know, any number of things that can come up with these. The questions of, and for them, they've got risk too in terms of what's the viability of this. Um, and so, this thing is is trying to strike a balance for both parties in terms of um, what's acceptable. Um, for example, like if you read through like the the force majeure, we're going back and forth on certain provisions of that about okay, what's something that stops their use of the facility and therefore it ends this entire project. And um, there's fine details anywhere in this. I'm happy to speak to, I could talk for hours about <coughs> this thing because there's a lot that goes into it. But um, University of Virginia, their local government site, they've got sort of a best practices, um, which is also a good resource. In addition, I thought the Charlotte County site agreement was, was a good resource. Um, but in terms of the background of what's going into this, then it's that consideration of what can the revenues be and then what's the risk going to be to the county. And then we also have to consider or at least appreciate what the risk is to the applicant. I think important to not just to highlight is, is the practices in this agreement uh, you know, if it is approved, I'll say that if, uh, it is fairly, it's consistent with what other communities have, have adopted. Uh, so I, we try to pick maybe the best language, best, best, best parts, add a little bit of our own sort of twist to it to a certain degree, but that, that's kind of important thing to remember that is really, it's, it's proven to, to an extent uh, what we've used. Very good point. Well, they've decoupled them, so we're we're in, we're instructed to look at them one at a time. Yeah, and since the majority of our questions are really about the special use application, um, now that, there are some things we've got to keep in mind about the zoning itself when we look at our our ordinances. So, I guess. Well, they've set it up now so that we have to deal with them separately even though we're discussing this SUP all along as we do it. So. I, I, I would say there are two different voting actions, but yeah. to have a conversation about either or right now, I think it's fine. You know, they're just two separate, you know, it, it, you know, a motion made, rezone, yes, no, a motion made, special use permit, yes, no. Of course, not doing that tonight, but that, that's the way I would recommend. And this is coming from their proposed decommissioning plan? Yep. Mm -hmm. well, we've got a statutory obligation to advertise and to discuss it. Um, so I suppose we're going to have to do it. Is, is that perhaps kind of a, a boilerplate 
boil and flake legalese when anything is transmitted from a, a law office? I've seen that before on, on other kinds of documents. And the one reason I asked that question is if I was a contractor and you gave me all this information, I have all the information I need to do the low bidding on your job. Just to address your question, Decom Solar was the contractor that we hired in it's, their contract with yeah. us. Would, would you introduce yourself? Oh, please? sorry. Uh, my name is Nick Sylvester. I'm the CEO founder of Leaf Talent Relations. So I've been the one directly been speaking to over the phone the last couple of months. So just to answer your question, Decom Solar has a contract with us to provide this documentation to us in order to formulate this plan. Within that contract, there's a full release. We can use this document however which way we want to. We paid them in full. That document becomes our our property essentially. So. We can yeah. talk about it. Yeah. 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 All right. For whoever it's applicable to, I guess I do have a question on the in the site plan under the decommissioning on. I guess it's about what the second or fourth page. Uh, there's a statement the parties agree that the decommissioning process shall take more than 12 months to complete. That contradicts the uh, ordinance. The ordinance says six months. That's easily changeable. Not okay, so not this on the decommissioning plan, you said? Yes. Uh, th so the, the 12 months is. is I think in the siting agreement, we actually have 12 months on the siting yep. agreement, but we can change it in the decom plan to match the siting agreement. Uh, possibly, yeah. To match the ordinance. Yep. Okay. I mean, I think theoretically the siting agreement governs technically everything that we're going to have to do here. And I think the siting agreement, as long as it has in there the particular time, then it will match up with the decom plan as well. So. Yeah, but neither one can contradict the ordinance. Correct. Yep. Okay. So. That, that wasn't changed because it was not physically possible to do it in six months. That was correct. some change. Yeah. So okay. we can technically get it done in three months if we add extra manpower mm -hmm. to it. It just depends on how many people we want to throw at it. So we can, that 12 months time period and wherever it appears can be changed to six months to match the ordinance. Correct. Okay. So yeah. Ligon, have we, have we had proper discussions on taking the, uh, the bond payments to on ESPN? We have had discussions about it. Um, I'll be happy to turn it over to. That was mentioned as a possibility, I think, in the decommissioning plan, but it's not been something that's been brought up in discussions on the site, I think. So as of now, it's not on the, really on the table. So yeah. right now it's starting at year, that's going to start at year one it's and good. not year 10. It would start with, I believe we said, submitting the site plan. The decommissioning bond would be in play. Yeah, so we were on the a call yesterday and we were going over a lot of these because it's been about an hour and a half or so. Okay. Um, I just want to know what I was reading. Yeah, it would be submitted. It would be submitted at... <laughs> our submission of the official site plan. That's when the bond would technically have to come into play. So having said all, so I've got a, is there any way, how do you keep up with, if this is decommissioned 35 years from now, and we're setting these prices at the bond at what it would cost right now, yeah. how do we account for 35 years when this comes up? We're gonna, so per, per our ordinance and the site plan, sorry, Nick. No, it's fine. Um, it gets reviewed every three years. And then the bond can get adjusted. So the bond's going to change then. At the review, I, I know Correct. I saw we're going to be reviewed at three years. But. And, and look, th this, and it's not necessarily a straightforward process or calculation of how that's done. I mean, they're telling me about, you know, the difference in the cost of steel and things like that. And then 
one of the terms that we're sort of going back and forth on is whether or not recycling or salvage value gets considered. Um, so these are the things that when I say each paragraph's got its own story to tell and there's more to it, then that's just an example of it. But yes, it, to your question, every three years it would get, that's per the ordinance and per this agreement. Interestingly enough, the, the ordinance specifies that the recycling uh, uh, cost, anything that can be recovered, is not considered part of the decommissioning. And I Noted. think that's pretty standard around the state, if I understand correctly. Now, that some of the things that probably do have to be considered, it's quite possible that you know, there's any number of things that could happen. For one thing, the Solar panels themselves may change drastically in 10 years with different materials. Um, now, that wouldn't involve decommissioning, but uh, it might involve replacement or something of that nature. Um, that's not addressed in any way. And, of course, it's also, at least I think, probably quite likely that at some point the government's going to start requiring recycling of these things rather than just disposal which might increase their decommissioning costs significantly. So those are some of the things that in the H3D will have to be dealt with, I think. Okay, so we talked, we mentioned the time period. We talked about the bond. Any other questions that have come up? About the whole, yeah, about anything. About yeah. anything. Yeah. Yeah. We, have, we still have two options on the table. It's either we go left out of the property down by Yoder's Market or we go right up by the school and connect to the three phase that runs basically right on the left-hand side of the school if you're looking at it. So we're in final study right now uh, with the utility company. They're gonna come back to us and basically give us the best feasible option for the least amount of cost and what they see is the best way to do it. And at that point, that's kind of gonna be the route. So it's either or. All those lines will be underground transmission lines, correct? We assume that they're going to connect to the existing infrastructure, right? That's how they always do it. So if it's an existing three-phase underground, then that's that's going to be the case. If, if they say they want to put pole structure up there and run the pole structure down, it'd be the same as if we brought a business into the B1 zoned area anyways and they would run poles across the other side of the property. But as of right now, the goal is to run three phase from us because it's going to be cheaper anyways. What's it going to look over here or on the ground? As of right now, we have to wait for the utility to go through their final yeah. study on that actual project. So it's it's mapping out the construction route, pricing out the materials, getting the contractors, so on and so forth. Who's the, is that REC's decision? It's REC's decision, yeah. We don't own that infrastructure. I had a conversation with a gentleman over at the Booth and Associates, and he was pretty pretty much saying it was going to be underground at a minimum of three feet. Yeah, yeah. So, it, again, right, it's the existing infrastructure that they have there. Yoder's has got to get three-phase coming in. The school's got three-phase over there. Any of those commercial properties, the auto dealer, they all have to have a certain level of power that's coming in, so the three-phase is already running there. If it's underground, that's what they're going to connect to. That's how they're going to do it. So, so, so it would be running underground. probably going to leave it there. I, I guess this may have changed in the intervening time period, but in some of the documentation that we had just recently received, uh, Rappahannock was talking about the two options. Their option one, which was the one headed south, they indicated was unlikely because of the difficulty of obtaining right of way. Uh, the option two was the one you're talking about going north, and they were specifically talking about above ground poles. I mean, they were listing pole one, pole two, pole three, what would be on each of these poles. Yeah, yeah, they have a preferred option, which is option two, mm -hmm. but option one is still available for us. 
we have a choice as the developer because there's costs involved that we have to pay directly on which option we want to choose. Option one may end up being more expensive than option two, but we still have to figure that out. Okay, so, so we still have no way of knowing what kind of infrastructure we're going to be seeing popping up along 29 then. I think it, at the end of the day, it's either going to be poles or it's going to be underground. Those are your two choices. <laughs> is there another option? There's no other option. Okay. That's all you got. All right. I was just checking on that. Well, yeah. I mean, there's, there's all you got. Bolts. Yeah, I mean, listen, it, it's, if you guys look and you go down by Yoder's and you see those wooden poles with what I like to call triceratops, right? So you see the three lines on the top of the pole. That's the type of poles that they would be considering running, not those big, nasty, huge metal ones that are down in Greene County down the road. Right, so smaller in size, they run the three phase over the top. It's not gonna be, if it was on any side, it wouldn't be on the actual side of Yoder's market, it would be on the opposite side of the street. It'd run down that way. And then if you connect with the three phase, it gives you an option two above ground with the three phase right by the school. When, when is this supposed to be decided? We're in final study now, but they have about a 45 day period, 60 day period to actually go through all this stuff and then the utility could get pushed out. In that regard, I, I have one question. I, if Luke Callan is responsible for bearing the cost of whether the lines are above ground or underground, wouldn't they have the ability to tell us that they're going to be underground or above ground now? I mean, it sounds like it's really a decision for Luke Callan to make, not a decision for REC to make. Yeah, I mean, our goal is to go with the cheapest option that we can get our hands on because it's obviously a large project and we've got a lot of costs that are coming into this and they're involved. But, I mean, me and Kaiser, who's our Vice President of Engineering, Construction and Procurement over here, we were talking about it at the same time. I mean, any infrastructure that you put here would be the same infrastructure that you would see if you put a normal business into the property. Right? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. please Hi, identify, identify uh, yourself. Yeah, well. Kaiser Guardiola, Vice President of Engineering. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the biggest um, sort of explanation that I can give you guys on the, uh, the infrastructure that's going to be needed to tie this facility into the existing grid is um, there's really not going to be any visual impact of any significant changes to the existing infrastructure um, that is... Um, already existing in the ad, uh, adjacent parcels, right? So like Nick was saying, um, over at, not at Yoder's, but directly behind the, the, the school, there's an existing three-phase line. There's really no changes to that. that that's going to stay as is, no changes. So as soon as you, you follow those lines, you go across the street from where the, the solar facility is being proposed, there's an existing single phase poles that are there. Um, they're wooden poles with single phase. Um, there's, there's no changes other than um, bringing two extra sets of lines overhead. Um, so like from a visual perspective, right, like when you're driving by the street, you're not going to notice any, like, any significant changes, right? You're, you're not going to notice that there's now three wires going over through those lines on the other side of the um, the street versus one. Um, and from a construction perspective, um, it's it's really minimal amount of work that's going to be needed to upgrade those lines. Um, it's not like a full rip and replace. It's it's more of a more of an upgrade. Um, and like Nick was saying, um, if for some reason, let's say like a commercial building was to be built in this location, that building's going to need power one way or another. So any time that like, we request a service um, for a facility, we're going to have to either install poles um, as close as possible to that facility. And then as soon as um, our uh, Raponic installs, installs that pole, then we can then decide to either go underground or overhead from that um, wherever they place their last pole or their service pole. Um, Yeah, and lastly, like it's, um, 
it's not those, it's not a transmission line. It's not, um, it's not any huge utility monstrous poles that you see like running across fields. It's the same power lines that you see um, going through the businesses that you see on the side of the roads. Um, and, that, and that's really the beauty of uh, distributed uh, generation. It's the same um, voltage that um, most commercial businesses use. Um, and that's why we're able to sell the power directly to uh, these facilities. Aren't these carrying about 28,000 volts? They, they are, but... So um, you're telling me a business, a regular business, carries 28,000 volts? Um, there's a step-up transformer right there, but on the primary side, uh, you know, before, like, the utility drops a step-down transformer on a commercial business, let's say they, they, they install, like, a, you know, those, those green transformers, and that unit right there steps it down from 20-something thousand volts to 480 or 208, 120. Um, okay, um, which in, in, our, in our case, our facility can accept a higher voltage. But this is carrying that same 28 all the way back to the substation, though, correct? Yes. I mean, all the way from the panels, all the way, whatever route you're taking, it's taking the 28,000 volts. It's not stepped down all the way back to the substation. Um, no, so the panels um, don't take 28,000 volts. Just we actually have a transformer on site. We have an inverter on site. And um, so we're converting DC power to AC, um, and then which um, the nominal voltage of the inverters is actually 800 volts, which is about maybe 10 years ago, this was 480 volts, which is about the same uh, nominal voltage a commercial building would have, but technology's kind of gone better, and we can now operate at 800 volts AC. I mean, it's probably insignificant, but the yeah. feasibility study says that you're going to be outputting uh, 34.5 kV. Yes, 34.5 kV is correct. Okay, and there's an existing distribution line just south of the high school is what you're saying. It's already a three-phase 34.5 kV capable line. Correct. So if you go north, all you have to do is reach that line. Uh, yeah, so we're not building outside of the property. Right. Um, but yes, that's... So, uh, okay, let me rephrase. If, if yeah. you connect to Rappahannock Electric and their line goes north, yeah. it's going north along 29 yeah. uh, until it reaches that existing line and then cuts across the side. It cuts across the street, um, and then they're going to upgrade those single-phase lines to three-phase. And then I think there's probably like... It just, it just ends right before the property starts. Um, okay, we drove by it today. It's like it just ends right where the property starts. So um, if there's any extensions needed, it's, it's a really, really short distance, probably like. Okay, so it's on the west side of 29. Yes. Right through the office park development there. Yeah. Okay. And then it crosses 29 again to get back across. Yes, like, like just like it would for any other businesses right. there because it's, it's more beneficial to keep them on one side of the road than keep them on it's both sides. Across is it north of Potter and then it's still uh -huh. across the street is going to still uh, yeah. look like this thing yeah. today. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Yes. Maybe There's a lot of working components here. I've made some phone calls and tried to understand this. And I, I know this is our first time of doing this. Would it be to our advantage to hire an outside consultant that could give us a lot of information here that we got a lot of smart people here. <laughs> but somebody that specializes in this definitely knows a lot more than we do. Would it be to our advantage to have somebody to look after that for us? Chairman, if I could, um, we have some engineering firms that we are already working with, and it may be appropriate rather than hiring a new consultant, if any of them have the capacity to take care of this, 
um, it, it may be appropriate for them to review um, everything that's been put together. I mean, my recommendation, I think it's a good question, is that if this is approved, um, you know, the, the next phase is the fish, site plan. So then they, you know, the applicant would come back with you know, your construction plans, the, you know, engineering plans, stormwater. It, uh, you know, that really is the time. I, I, you know, whether or not they're going to know before the fifth where that route will be. It sounds like it'll be on their property. There's a couple different options. It doesn't sound to be really out of the norm or really obtrusive as far as where it would look. Uh, so I, I really think that layer of technicality, we, we've gotten pretty technical to our best ability in what we've already done, but I think that's really where, you know, like with the decommissioning plan, we can hire a, a, a third-party engineer to review decommission plan to, you know, we would, you know, we would also review the technical, the, 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 the engineering of it as well during that time. So. That's just sort of my take on it. It was that that would be probably the, the better time. Uh, not, not that you can't ask questions and, and now, but uh, that would really be willing to really kind of delve into maybe some of the some of these finer points. Well, one of the reasons that we're asking you this now is, for example, uh, we have Mr. Yoder, who's a very civic-minded, good neighbor in Madison, with a, a well-established business, well-known business there, and about the only thing he asked, other than you shed buffer was that you not build a power line across from in front of his store. And that is their option A that they were talking about was more in that direction. It still wouldn't technically be in front of his store because it'd be on the other side. Uh, across the road, the road. Right. I understand that, yes. Nevertheless, there's a power line where they were using <coughs> one now. Agreed, and we obviously want to accommodate there, yeah. so I mean, we're down here to have those conversations. So. And we've got nothing from REC actually outlining option A and B and Preliminarily, what do you mean as to how they're going to construct it? No, I mean that that's the process that they're going through right now. Yeah. yeah. So, right. So it's really speculation. I mean, there's only a couple key points to this for me that are sort of a make it and break it, and that's been one that's been on a lot of people's minds and been mentioned for months, months and months and months. Where are these things going? Speculating they're going to be above ground or below ground. You know, I don't. Tunneling under 29, picking up that line, coming back across, all that's fine, but it's still spe it's all speculation. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, right? There's there's really only two ways that they can do it, and I think that it's the way that they do their construction throughout the county all the time. Right. I mean, they could do it theoretically on well, on northbound to, northbound 29. They could run it right down 29. transmission in there. I'm sure they've got easements written all over the place that they have right away access in certain areas and they can get it pretty quite easily. So but I mean again at the end of the day, like Kaiser mentioned, it's it's minimally intrusive at best. I mean you're not gonna notice anything if it was above ground or below ground. Favorite okay, group. yes. Um having visited uh several um um solar facilities, mm -hmm. which I have pictures of, um, other than the panels, actually everything else is pretty much minimal that I was at. I was at one that was 150. That's big difference. It was big, huge. Yeah. It was like all over you. Yeah, it was, it was a huge farm. Um, and then they were building another one right across. The guy likes the, the farmer likes the idea of the yeah. farm. But it's in, in, this one was in Buckingham County. And then we saw smaller ones. Um, and the inverters do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much aware of the, the simple noise that they make my my neighbor running his um, blower is noisier than standing next to the inverter pretty much. It's yeah. probably minimal when it does work. Same thing with the rotation of panels. Yeah. Very, very minimal um, sound. But anyway, REC has built other, haven't they partnered with somebody in Spotsylvania? Is it Spotsylvania they have a partnership with for a solar facility? They would have to, well, they are so they're, in Spotsylvania. I don't know if, whether... I mean, REC is whether, part of it, partnering with REC. It'll depend on whether it connected to the distribution grid or whether they connected as a, as a... That would be easy enough to find out. And they have, if they have, which I thought they had, 
And I thought I had heard from someone at REC that they were committing to try to have a solar facility in, in each of their counties because they believe in the, the future of solar power. Mm -hmm. um, so if they have, they already have what they do, like you said, whatever they're doing is what they do. Yeah. And it's really simple. You got the yes, power produced, it's gotta go one way or the other. And yeah. so to me, it's very simple. I do wish we did have it. I agree, but that's on REC. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, REC. Once it leaves a, your property or your. Yeah, REC is making a push, ODEC is making a push, and then you have APCO and Dominion. I mean, Dominion's one of the largest for sure of solar in the country right now. So they're doing this push in that direction. Right. Just on a, on a different topic altogether, I think we've probably done all we can on the polls tonight. Um, I was pleased to see, as far as I can tell, everything's been checked off that are required for the special use application, uh, except possibly one thing. I have not seen uh, the SCC approval. I assume you have that, but we have not seen anything in any of the paperwork. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll check on that with our team and... Yeah, since uh, PJM obviously is not involved because it's distribution, correct? But the ordinance does say SCC approval also, so we need to, you know, verify that somewhere. For yes. Us. Mr. Chairman, I I, yes, I saw a couple more things um, yes. on here. It, it, it's in there. It's uh, asking for you all to to. Show us what our electrical power usage for our current year is in mm -hmm. Madison. Um, also, I looked at the impact, uh, you know, and we were asking for an impact of the facility on rivers and streams. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's in there. I, I didn't see it. And also procedures and protocols for managing risk of fire. Uh, they were the other three things that, that I saw that, I mean, I am um, terribly unprepared for tonight, but those are three things did, did you guys, did, are those things answered that y'all know of? We forwarded the wetland delineation report. Um, so, Megan, I don't know if, if you had a chance to, to distribute that, but you have that. We have a phase one environmental okay. as well that we've done. And so that's readily available. Um, and, the and what was the last one? Risk of fire, you know. Yeah. Procedures and protocols for managing risk of fire. Yep. We've talked about that a few times. That normally comes at the end of the project, right, once everything's done. But we can formulate a plan and just put a one-pager together for you and have that there if you'd like to see it. So and you have to do a full training with your yes. with your county firemen, police officers, the whole nine before the system actually gets turned on and rolls. So. And I have a question for the lawyers, I think. Because <laughs> uh, I helped write this ordinance you know, whenever it was written. Um, and we used the best knowledge that we had um, and worked on it for a very long time. And using, like I said, the best knowledge that we had from pretty much all over the country and especially close by and folks that, we, that already have these facilities. So for instance, I'm reading, um, the lawyer part would be this. I'm reading in our safety access on our ordinance, it says lock boxes and keys will be provided. What if there is, now that we are five years down the road and there's a better way to secure this, can we deviate from this ordinance without having to be, you know, like we used the best language that we could at the time. What if things have improved into a better way that we agree that we're going to use a different way because it's better? What, how does that impact the, the ordinance? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, we'll be in the setting agreement. Okay, so. Uh, we can agree to deviate it. And no, that's. The rest of your ordinance still applies. Because I think you have to be considerate of the fact that, first of all, we're not experts, but we did try to put things in that we, everybody that we, we were consulting with, said, don't do, I mean, be sure you do this, be sure you do this, but five years later, especially if it's a technical thing, there's got to be, and that's why we didn't get too technical here, because what do we know about the, you know, we just used the 50%, and that is very easy to get, um, Carter, you just mentioned, um, mm. It is, and it's well under that. Uh, I've already checked that because I just requested that. Uh, you know the, what our usage, what you've already looked at that, right? The size of the facility, the generated power, will be limited to 50% of the annual total power usage of all users in Madison County. Yeah, <clears throat> so we can't get that from, we can't get that from the utility company, but a basic Google search says that 
use about 204,000 megawatt hours a year, and this system is well below that, right? Yes. So you would need about 100,000 megawatt hours. This system, I think, we're at like 31,000 or something right around there. Um, yeah, I can get it. I know who to contact. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I have it for, um, when was the last time we considered it? It's 2021. Yeah. And this was well under half of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it yes. definitely is, yeah. So that's what we, we found out. And I could find that paperwork. It's, yep. Uh, on an entirely different topic, um, the submission of the viewshed analysis, uh, I assume that was computer generated. Uh, was that done assuming the uh, vegetative buffers were in place, or was that done? So you have multiple options where it showed not in place and then in place. Uh, what, what we saw was only showing one thing, so I, I don't know. Yeah, so like... So for example, right there, if you look at that one picture, all of the blue that you see, that's what you can actually visually see from any one particular area, and it will right, outline right. the area that they're looking from. And they actually went to the project site and did this looking on to make sure that they got all the, the measurements and whatnot when they went in okay. to actually computer generate it. So they did that from the, from the site as it exists now? Multiple different views, yep. Okay, yeah. So. Well, that's good in a way because assuming that that's as it is now, the buffering would reduce that somewhat. So this is incorporating a buffer, right? So if you oh, if you go to the one where you where you have Yoder's okay. Market, it will show you a view from Yoder's Market. With the buffer, you can't see anything but maybe one percent from Yoder's Market, okay. not a single stitch of it, based on this analysis. So all of that light blue is stuff that you you should be able to see. You can see the the panels from those locations. Yeah. Yes. So when okay. you when you go through it, just pay attention to the okay. different locations that they're calling out, and then it will actually show you this is what it looks like now. What you can see when the buffer goes up, this is the amount of the property you'll be able to see with the buffer up. So from twenty nine, about eight percent of this system will be visible. The other ninety two is hidden. And from Yoder's market, like I said, it's 1%, if not 0%. Is that based upon the, uh, the mature height of the trees? or? It, yeah, it's based on the trees as they're planted. As they're planted. Yeah. So as they're planted, they're obviously going to grow to a mature height, and then they're, it just becomes even better than that. And that's all outlined in that plan as well. Okay. I, I was curious because that's actually a, a significant impact on the viewshed, especially uh, both to the west and the east. Uh, there's a, a lot of places where it's going to be fully visible. And they're, you know, they're, uh, let's see, there's, there's, there shouldn't uh, actually be a lot of places at all that this thing is fully visible. It's going to be minimally road visible. On the, uh, on the east side of it, there's a large area along there that's Anything, yeah, anything that's blue within those panels. So the, the, the dark blue is the panels. The light blue is what you can see from any one particular area. So the aqua so over. Correct. Yeah, so the aqua, aqua is what you can see. Dark blue is the actual panels themselves. So right yeah. there, if you look at that, that's an image. All that light blue is what you can see from that one particular part, and then the rest of the system is covered except for that one little spot in that northwest area. We're, we're talking at cross purposes here. <laughs> you see, the, if the, the, the light, teal colored is inside of the if, blue. If area. I'm standing in the light blue, then the teal color, looking toward the facility, yep. I can see those panels. You cannot. You so see the, the light blue is where you can't see the panels. If you're standing there yeah. in the light blue area, looking toward the facility. Yeah. I, I apologize. I might not be doing a good job explaining it, so just let me. Let me yeah. So if I'm standing, if, if you're right here where the where the where the uh, yeah. arrow is, I'm right there. I I can't see it. Correct. Is that what you're saying? I can't see it, but I could see it here. No. Right. So each one of these images in a viewshed analysis, the way that you do it is you go in and you take particular images at particular places across an, an area. Right. So you're going to do a laser shot. You're going to take some pictures. You're going to download those into a computer, and you're going to generate the different heights, right, from the topography that you're able to take. So when you look at each one of these, anything that's in the teal from one picture, 
if you go to the Yoder's market picture, if it's easily identifiable, you'll be able to tell. So that's from the back side of the property, looking looking directly north, yeah. right? Anything that's teal is what you would be able to see from standing on the back side of the property in that one spot where they took it, and it all outlines it there for you. So if you end up going, I think it's a little further down, Mikey. Right These are the only ones I have. I, okay. Yeah, the, so the, the full view shed analysis plan, which I think we submitted to you guys. Yeah, you did. I, I might have missed one, I'll okay. be honest with you. I might have missed that one. Going. So you'll actually be able to see, and it will, it, the whole plan outlines the actual buffer that we're putting around it, shows you an image from 29, what it looks like now, and what it will look like when the buffer is there. An okay. image from Yoder's. I've seen, I've seen the photo. Yeah. yeah, so all of that's included in there. So the teal from standing in one spot is what you what's visible. Okay. Just think of it that way. All right. You're standing somewhere on the site. Correct. Looking outward. Looking at towards okay. the system. Therefore, if I'm correct in my understanding of this, if I'm standing in the teal area looking into the site, then I can see whatever point you were standing on when you were looking out of the site. These aren't taken from in the site, they're taken from without, from outside of the site looking in. Because that's the whole point. You're, you're okay. trying to figure out if you can actually see it beyond the buffer from particular areas. All right, so from somewhere within those teal areas, you were looking into the site and cannot see it. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying from the particular point in which they were taken, right, the images that were taken, for, for example, one was taken in the back of Yoder's Market, uh -huh. literally in the parking lot, and you'll see in the image, you'll have some teal area overlaying onto the project site. That basically means that from standing right in the back of their parking lot and looking diagonal out into the property and going around, those teal areas would be the only peak that you would be able to see from that one particular location. Does that make sense? Not really. I think maybe this viewshed analysis needs to be clarified somewhat. Okay. Yeah. And, and the solar panels were a, a little bit taller in those teal areas than the, than the, uh, the, the perimeter landscaping. So you're able to see it because it's a little bit higher, but most of the rest of the site is lower than, um, than the landscape buffers when you're not able to see it. All right. The view shed analysis that I want to see is basically if I'm somewhere surrounding this, mm -hmm. looking in that direction, yeah. do I see the panels? That's what this, that, that's what this is. Okay. Yeah. And you're telling me that the this greenish color, teal yeah. or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. If I'm standing in one of those locations, anywhere in one of those teal locations, yeah. do I see the panels or not? Uh, that's a good question. So it says here it's visible area. The teal is visible. Well, it cannot be this tall tree. It has to be scaled. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's, stop there. that's what I'm assuming, but that wasn't what was being said. Well, I mean, theoretically, <laughs> I mean, if you're standing right on Route 29 and you're in front of the buffer, you're not going to see anything. And that's part of the teal that you see right there. If you're across the way and some of that teal over there, you might be able to see it, but they didn't take their particular image from that one section. Right, the way that this is looking is a diagonal on from the project over on this southwest side. So if you zoom out, that's everything that you'll be able to see. You see the teal up in the project over there. You can see the top of Yoder's Market. I mean, Yoder's Market from that area isn't even visible. So that's what the view shed does. Particular points all across 29 and other visible areas. And then they provide you with a snapshot of what you can see and what you can't see. But overall, 92% of the project is hidden from all locations. I'm going to try once more. Yeah. Is there something on these over here that might be worth looking at? Yes. Yeah. That's so the, I think that's where the. It, it is. And, where this and again, these are just okay. three pictures. The actual full plan, which is what I think you, we may not actually have it totally up on here, but the full plan shows you. It goes into an explanation as to what they did, how they did it, how they calculated it, so on and so forth. So, Ligon, I believe it's in the Dropbox that we shared with you. So, if we haven't shared it with everybody, we can. You could share it with everybody, but yeah, I will get it. I mean, I 
I'm, I, you know, such a large document. I thought I had had it yeah, all. No, so no, I, no I apologize, but yeah. yeah. But yes, to answer your question, it, it would tell you exactly what you're saying. So, Dan, thank you for sorry bearing yeah. with no, us. No, no, gosh, that was painful. Well, I was about to use an um, example and have people stand yeah, up. Yeah, we just we just need to know. I think everybody just needs to know where we're standing when we do or don't see whatever. Yeah. And, and so, but that, but all of this basically lends to where I am at with this, which is I'm prepared with all of the information. Um, you know, I, I looked through about 70 or 80 pages of documents. I think I missed about 40 <laughs> between 4 p.m. and, you know, 6 p.m. And, you know, I haven't had a chance to look through this, but apparently all the information is not any, there anyway. And, you know, the public hearing is two weeks away. We're talking about getting engineers that we've already engaged with involved to review some of the stuff and return some of maybe just to make sure something, a third look, a second, I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we're talking about. We don't really know where the, the lines are going, um, which is a big issue, transmission lines, once you guys get it off the property. Just, just distribution, not transmission. Yeah, sure, yeah. sorry, distribution. Um, you know, I mean, I, I for one feel fully unprepared to make a educated vote in two weeks. Be given the fact that we're still not, we still don't have all the information. Yeah, and so that is all pending. I think everything for the sub, we have a shared Dropbox with Living in Canada. I don't know if you're on it, but it has all the information that, that you've basically completed since the last time we talked to you guys. We checked all the boxes. It's all fully documented and it's all, it's all fully up there. So we can We'll double check just to make sure, but we're pretty confident that it's there. Um, I think just those other that? three points that we have there. Additionally, all of these documents, the viewshed analysis, the decom plan, all this stuff, they've been done by third-party licensed engineers already. So we're not the ones dictating it. We're just signing contracts for them to produce the materials for us and the documents. So I'm not necessarily sure what a third-party engineer is gonna, is gonna do for us. Um, you know, we're happy also to come, you know, stay down, come back down, bring in the working parties that have worked with us on these particular documents and have you answer, you know, ask them the questions as well so they can answer it. We're happy to come down and just do a strictly question and answer, let you guys go through the documents more. I mean, however, which way, there you go. I mean, th this gives you some more information there too on the view shed. So it shows you what 29 looks like now and then what we're proposing Right, and then it will show you that bottom one, I think, is from Yoder's parking lot, what it looks like now and what we'd be proposing. And that's what would be planted all around. So that helps. And then it will also outline all the other stuff. Okay. So, um, how, how far out from the property is this viewshed analysis going? Uh, it will detail it in the plan. Okay, good deal. Right. For one thing, just one simple question. If I were standing in the middle of the field up on the edge of Courthouse Mountain, mm. what would I see? Yeah. I mean, if you were on top of a mountain and you were higher, I would assume you're going to see the solar. Yeah. Or if I'm over on uh, Fairground Road, what will I see? If I'm over on some places along O'Neill's Road, looking to the west, what will I see? Well, you're going to have to get significantly higher than the property right now to be able to see it, technically. That is. Yeah, so I mean, just to answer your question, we're happy to help you guys answer any questions. If you go through this stuff and you have questions and you want to send us emails, we can know we're pretty responsive and pretty much anything that you ask us. Hopefully so. this information is already there somewhere. It is. Uh, and I've got to admit that Ligon did try to prepare a lot of this stuff and apparently it more or less crashed the, system, the county system. So. There's a, there's Here's Fairground Road, just out of... Yeah. Just We have, yeah, we've we've asked we with our landowners. We agree, and it would also help with any visual impacts, minimal visual impacts that may come from it. We've tried a couple different property owners 
Um, me and Kaiser came up, we, we may have one other option that we're going to try to to go that's uh, the way Yoder's kind of connected his three phase in from a from a road from the back of his property, but we can still generate an easement. So there's, again, right, we're, we asked, we were denied, but we have, we have taken that. But. Where's your ingress, egress from 29? I think it shows it on the site plan right now. There's uh, already the a little road entrance. For, uh, no. Oh, the one that's the one already there. there. Correct. Okay. Yep. Well, I knew what had talked about yeah. coming in off of Yoder's. Correct. Right? Well, we talked about coming in off of Yoder's. We haven't, we haven't gone and talked to him and asked him for any of that. I think we probably want to generally avoid that as much as possible because you are going to have trucks coming in when we're dropping racking off and the modules off. So we'd rather not inflict any issues of having kind of his business interrupted. And that's just as good of a spot, especially for emergency vehicles and all that kind of stuff. So. That is located at a crossover too, I think, isn't it? Yeah. It, it doesn't have turn lanes, but it's a crossover. Mm -hmm. And yeah, actually, once once the facility is complete, then you don't have construction crews. We won't even, out. yeah, we won't even be there. You'll see probably a pickup truck coming in from time to time to do regular maintenance on the facility, and then you'll have, um, you know. Our plan is to have bees and some sheep running around, so you're going to see that stuff out there too. You may have a shepherd running out there and some beekeepers, but that's about it. <laughs> Which I reminded myself of something else I wanted to ask. Uh, number of uh, permanent employees on site that you are intending to have? There's nobody that's going to be on site full nobody time. Nobody permanent, not even one. Uh, you, are you going to be subcontracting the beekeepers and the shepherds and so forth? Or? We'll, we'll be subcontracting the sheep. Yep, and then our plan is to, to basically partner with local beekeepers in the area and let them have access to go in and, and basically have their own bees in the area and take the honey, and, and that's kind of what they're going to do. So I own a farm up in Connecticut. We do bees, and that's kind of how, how our process works. So. Okay, and at this point, none of this is anywhere written down in any of the... It generally will come with the official site plan, and we outline so the particular areas. expect that to be in the site plan. Correct. Okay. Yeah, we'll have one, details one, and everything that goes in that. Yeah. One of the things that we have, and as Mr. Jewett pointed out for us, uh, the details need to be written down. <laughs> You'll have the details in the, the official site plan. Yeah, I mean, that, that will be like a four to six page document and all stuff with flyer schedules, all kinds of stuff. Does Ruth Callen intend to hold on to this project or sell it? What's sort of the plan once it's established yeah right now we will right now we will be the owners I myself will be the owner um, we do have a joint venture partnership with Madison Energy Investments which is a local Virginia business here um, that is an option for us to assign the asset to and they'll become the long-term owners and we will become the operations and maintenance provider for the system we haven't started conversations we've had a few conversations with them but it hasn't progressed Yet we're still waiting to see how this is going to end up before we really dive into that significantly. But that would be the only other option. Okay. Any other questions for our applicant? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, any uh, public comment at this time on this? Yes, sir. <laughs> you know the, the, the rule. Identify yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, he says hold you to three minutes. <laughs> I'll do my best to be brief tonight. Yes, you guys have heard me talk enough. I'm Alan Nichols. I'm a neighbor to the south. Um, I'm going to talk in two parts, though. I'm going to address the, uh, some of the items on the special use permit first, and then I'd like to come back to what's the most important and the overlooked bit of this, which is the rezoning. A um, couple things. Uh, I read through all the documents that were provided on the website. I got through a chunk of the, uh, the siding agreement, but it came three hours before the meeting and it's almost 7,000 words. So I couldn't get through all of that this evening. But I did notice a couple things. We have an awful lot of inconsistencies here. 
but it makes it hard to reconcile the documents when we're trying to get a picture of the facility. You guys have raised good questions tonight, trying to get a handle on all the aspects of the project. But some things that I noticed is, um, in our siting agreement, we talk about a 16 megawatt facility. In the, where did it go? In the decommission, where is it? Feasibility study, we talk about a 16.75 megawatt. And then in the economic report, we talk about a 15.3 megawatt. So we've had different versions of this thing come along the way. And it makes sense that, you know, we think we're going to do it one way, they're going to look at it one way or another. But, you know, 4.5% is a lot. It might mean the difference between a certain type of power line or another, depending on the scale that it ends up with. And I think those things are important to clarify, especially between what the economic report says and the feasibility study. I mean, you've got almost a 9% almost a difference on the scale of the project. Um, the U-shed analysis on here I, I think is insufficient because I have the Piedmont Environmental Council U-shed plan that they developed when the project originally came to the table years ago. I think it was August of 2020 maybe when we did it originally. And it shows a very large area of the county and shows when on how the topography goes, there are areas that are going to squeeze <coughs> the panels from all over the place. So you have high points everywhere around the county where residents will be able to see it. And so I think they, taking a look at the use analysis from a larger area is very important. And having it presented in such a manner that is clear to see which neighbors are going to be able to see what facility and to what point. Um, I was able to make sense of what was there and the limited scope that's there, that it was provided. And you are able to see it from, um, from my property very clearly, Yoder's, um, the Gunn family, which is on Fairground Road, primary school, the high school, the food line, the athletic field, uh, at Hoover Ridge, and Courthouse Mountain Road residents. And if you look at the top of O'Neill's Road, there are places where you can look down and see the facility. Uh, there's a great big tuber, ho tuber house in the first line of O'Neill's at the top, and that whole little section there looks right over that field, and they're going to have a great view of this solar facility. So I don't know if anyone's reached out to them, but you're going to hear from them if, uh, if not. Uh, the decommissioning plan I combed through a little bit, and one thing that concerns me on here, they keep they were talking about in the last meeting that they want to be responsible in the removal of the panels, and there were a lot of recycling comments that came up that they would be recycled. And right now, the National Renewable Energy um, Laboratory, um, their study was dated in October of 22, so it's fairly recent as studies go. Uh, estimated the cost of recycling a panel was between $15 and $45, and the cost of a panel going to landfill is between $1 and $5. Um, given that you can do some basic math here, and we have a budget in there of $52,890 for removing the panels, that's only $1.43 per panel they're going to fill up a landfill. So you know that going into it, if that's the plan. Um, I did notice that in the site plan that's provided now, and there's about three or four different versions up there, the landscape plan only shows landscape buffer and the <coughs> immediate L shape around Yoder, going to the north and over to the top. There is nothing for the residential district to the south. Yep, almost all of it's fine. There's just no <laughs> residential buffer. There was no vegetated buffer there. Uh, I know that uh, Mr. Carpenter in the last meeting requested that they put vegetative buffer around the entire property, and uh, it's not there. I also noticed that the setbacks on these site plans are mentioned at 100 feet, but they're to the best of my ability to read the visuals provided. They are the setbacks are not increased for the area surrounding the tree. The ordinance, and I have it here if you want it. Um, 14, 19, 3, section B, items 1 and 2 say that there will be additional buffering or additional setbacks, pardon me, uh, from the creek area to be extended. We want to make sure that if it were approved, everything was done the way that it was supposed to be. Uh, there's a number of other uh, inconsistencies in the documents that you guys are, are, are doing a good job of digging in the rest, so I'm going to let you keep doing it. Um, the last thing I want to talk about I'd like to read something really short that I put together uh, about the rezoning. And like I say, this really is the thing that we're overlooking the most in this project, that we're taking something that's really only B1 and we're changing it to industrial. I'll be brief and then I'm done. 
Industrial zoned land adjacent to residential zoned land is generally a bad idea. Industrial activities often generate noise, air pollution, and heavy traffic, which can significantly impact the quality of life for residents leading to health issues and decreased property values. The stark contrast in land use disrupts the aesthetic appeal and harmony of the residential environment, causing conflicts between industrial and residential stakeholders. While poppers are proposed for this project, we don't have to look very far in the past to see what the future will hold. At one of the prior comp plan meetings, when the planning commission was discussing the alteration of setbacks for commercial solar from 300 feet to 100 feet, one of the previous members of the planning commission, and you guys can correct me, but I, I believe it was Mike Fisher who stood up here, and he made the comment that there was a good reason that the setback was made to be 300 feet when they developed the ordinance, and it should remain the required setback. Planning Commission went on and voted to approve the change to 100 feet. And just, pri and just prior to the, bo the Board of Supervisors voting, uh, then Board Member Kevin McGee stated, he said something to the effect of, I'm an engineer, and I believe in efficiency, and we should make the most efficient use of the space possible and get as many panels on the space as we can, so we should reduce the setback to 100 feet. Mr. McGee felt that he knew better than the prior leadership. If this zoning change is approved in 20 plus minus whatever years, if the subject property changes hands, it will still be zoned M1. The new owners will purchase the property knowing this and will expect to have all of the right by uses contained in the county zoning ordinance. No one will remember the reason as to why these proffers were put in place or the assurances made to the neighbors. The current leadership at that time will most certainly know better than the prior leadership and approve any, any of the M1 uses that are desired. I had a conversation with Mr. Webb earlier this week and he said that this was also likely to be the case. So based on this alone, I believe that the industrial zoning adjacent to a residential district is inappropriate and should be rejected. Thanks guys. Thank you. Other public comment? Any other public comment? Okay. Uh, that being the case, um, since we pretty much covered this pretty thoroughly, uh, case number SU-07-23-13 is simply the application for the special use permit for the commercial solar facility. Um, basically repeating the same information that was in the previous case. Uh, at this point, Ligon, do you think it's, you need to add anything? No, I mean, that? we'll continue to. Okay. <laughs> any, anyone have any, any question for Ligon or about the SUP itself? Okay, um, and personally, I think I agree with Nathan. We, we are still, we're still asking questions that are not adequately answered right now. And we have two weeks before we're supposed to address this in the joint meeting. Okay, uh, public hearing preview. Um, rather than for me to read each one of these, Lee can just go ahead and explain those for us, if you would. Okay, sounds good. Uh, this is was we talked about this one a year ago, and uh, you might recall. I'll just bring us up. This is a a garage. Uh, the applicant uh, they have to you know we have to install a bathroom. They did get an engineer uh, a year ago. They did get an engineer to evaluate the building, and uh, they have, I do have a copy of that. Uh, there are a few things they have to do to bring the building up to code wise. Uh, I think uh, you know, and one of the items to bring up to code is also have a have a bathroom for a commercial garage. <coughs> the applicant is aware and is working on getting perk test and all that right now. 
Uh, whether or not this will be heard uh, in in August kind of remains to be seen. Just want to put it on everyone's radar. We'll see. You know, we have all the documents we need. I think we will have enough to go forward. But you can see, I'll just give you an aerial view here. Um, this is, I mean, folks around here know more than I do, but that this has been a garage. I think the biggest concern, as you can see, and I've told the owner, we really got to get a handle on the, the number of cars uh, out of here that are in front. Uh, you know, I think that that number six works well out front, and there's an area back here that could be fenced in. Uh, the person who's been operating a garage there is not operating, so it's someone else. The, the, the individual that lives here would like to rent it uh, and is willing to invest what it takes in to bring it up to the code and get the bathroom and get it rezoned. Uh, so if you look at the packet, I just showed the area that is proposed to be rezoned to B1. You can see right in here is roughly the, the area. And here is the rough dimensions. That would leave three acres. That would be A1. <clears throat> so a few things to work through with. Uh, you know, I'll determine uh, here in a few weeks if we have enough to go forward for, for August. I think we should be okay. But this area right here would be the... Um, would be the you know the the fenced in area if there's some extra overflow cars and uh, would, would be located. So and I think the park area is right in here. And I'll get the records. I, I forget exactly where the house's septic is, but that would not be able to be used. Uh, I don't think it's large enough. So, any questions? I just have one. What happened with this like a year ago or whenever this? Uh, well, they're applying for a special use permit, and then the uh, issue was brought up with the uses on a parcel. Yep, exactly. Uh, and I mean, so, but we never voted on anything. Like, no, they, they tabled just, it or withdrew. They just tabled it. They withdrew it. it yeah. They've operated, and then, right. I was going to say, haven't they just been operating? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's been a. I mean, it's been a garage. I for sort a, of yeah. went down the road of maybe grandfathering it and having them bring it up to standard, just do all those things, and maybe with a limitation of how many cars they could have, but it was decided that to go ahead and rezone would be the best best option. Uh, so it gets some conditions on it, and I told the owner, you know, she wasn't operating the shop, she was renting it to, I think, a relative, and I just told the owner that really you have to keep it to site clean. That That's really the, the rub here. Not that I've gotten a lot of complaints on it, but um, it, it does, it, is, it has been fairly unsightly, and uh, hopefully uh, we can, we can it's been unsightly well, for a long time. He's asking to rezone 1.6 acres, and the way that land lands there, whatever, in 1.6 acres, you're going to be able to park your cars, get a drain field in there, and do everything you need to do on that small Well, I don't know if the drain field would be on that, uh, in that B1. I mean, I, I think it's in this area would be the drain field. But as far as parking the cars, yeah, I think there's plenty of space back here uh, to park to park the cars. I mean, the owner of the property is going to maintain ownership. They're not dividing this. They just want to rezone, rezone the small cars. part. Are we going to be able to keep a grip on this? I don't see any reason why not. I mean, um, yeah, well, I haven't really. I mean, you know, I mean, it's. Well, they'll have they'll have a rezoning and they'll they'll have conditions they'll have to follow. I mean, I'm chasing people after cars all the time, yeah. junk car. That that is a nonstop. I mean, well, that, I mean you know, it's. I, so. I'm afraid if we do this, this is going to get back out of hand again and just get worse. Well, I mean, if we have a, a set of real specific conditions, how many cars? Set a condition on the buy right. Uh, well, it's well, well, they're rezoning it to to be to be. So in order to in order so to. If you rezone this, if you rezone this to a B one. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They can put condition. I mean, you know, they, uh, we can't, you know, we, we can't uh, force the conditions, but as part of the rezoning, we say, here are the concerns. I recommend that you <coughs> address these things. And everyone I've ever worked with in 
20 years of doing this have always said, yep, yeah, that sounds good. I'll be happy to to do A, B, and C if this means um, she wants to operate it. It's a garage. It's been used for a garage. I guess there's some rental income for the owner out of it uh, and is willing to, in, to, 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 to make it right and put some conditions forward that we keep the site clean and, order, and orderly in order to operate the garage. Um, well, in a rezoning, they, they need to come from the applicant. In a rezoning, have a spe in a special use submit, have a, you have very, you know, a lot more latitude to say these are going to be the conditions. But talking to Ms. Ramos, I mean, she, she's willing to do whatever is recommended uh, in order to get it rezoned. Uh, so, you know, I don't think we can just say to her, if you do A, B, and C, we will rezone you. But A, B, and C might be a good idea. Uh, we would look at it favorable if you address these items. One of the big items is the, the site just looking trashy and having cars everywhere. Um, you know, I just sent a letter to an individual I just <coughs> became aware of. I won't say where road, but there's an individual in the county that has probably 60 junk cars all up and down the road. I just became familiar with it. Just sent a certified letter out. I mean, it's... I don't even think that we we, we should... I've talked about it. We just haven't had time. We probably should re revisit the whole junk car ordinance. Um, hmm. uh, I think it's a little lenient. It says inoperable. <laughs> if it's operable, it's not, you know. So I think well, we could. Well, if it was a five, it would be all right. But when it goes beyond five. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, and now, no, no, it, it's a country thing. I don't mean that in a bad way. If you drive, you don't know what county you're in, you will just fall. You'll just drive by places that people Keep cars, old cars, junk cars. It's just sort of, I see it in Page. I see it in Louisa. I see it, doesn't make it right, but, you know, we constantly are having to get after people. Then a lot of folks, they just don't feel very motivated. They just, hey, it's been there for several years or no one's complained now. And, uh, you know, and all we can really do is find them. It's not really a criminal. Uh, when Sean and I have taken some junk people, uh, cars to court and had some success, but it's, it's, it's pulling teeth. It's not easy. And you go back and forth. They clean it up a little bit, and a few come back. So, um. Well, we seem to have several of these automotive shops. I mean, this makes two tonight. And so they seem to be kind of wanting to do this. So I think somehow or another we need to come up with some kind of resolution to um, keep it in order for them. I just think we need, however that needs to be. Yeah, I think improving the junk car ordinance where it just says something like, a person can five, you know, if your cars well, are, if the cars are registered to you and you got a license plate on them, that's fine. But if it's not registered to you and just a dead plate, no inspection sticker, and you've got 10 of these on your property, then you, you're in violation. So I think we need just need to make it a little, uh, well, strong. Yeah, it does, but it, <laughs> just, it, it just says five over five inoperable, yeah, inoperable. And I think we could be a little more specific, saying cars aren't registered. Uh, but we also want to be, I mean, look, I mean, uh, somewhat um, understanding that uh, sometimes people have cars, in, in these, you know, and, and we don't, you know, but it gets to a point, well, yes, if it comes a junkyard, it's unsightly. We will get complaints like the one that has 60 plus cars on it uh, all up and down the road. I had no idea. <laughs> it's a black hole for conversation. When you talk about junk cars all the time, right. we probably do need to address the issue of them. Right. Not all garages are going to be a thing. Um, the majority of garages are going to be compliant with um, part of the business. Unfortunately, in a small locality, it's going to be challenging no matter what we do. Um, and we know everybody, uh, which makes it harder than it is. I think Sean and Wigan have. They've sent out some letters. Uh, that seems to be. Yeah, so there you go. yeah I, I think this is probably an appropriate resolution to this particular problem, but I think we also need to be prepared uh, when the neighbors find out that we're trying to rezone this, they, they're going to say it's spot rezoning. So, 
Well, my, my only comment, my comment to that, there are spots where there are different zonings. And, and my only thing about that is if you say it's spot zoning, then you're saying there can't be any mixed use or anything in, 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 in an area, that it all has to be residential, and that's not usually the case. So, um, you know, I I would prefer just give them special use permit and not have to do the zoning, but, you know, we, this is... And it's not six acres. This is what... The, this is what seems to be a, um, something that's important uh, to, to, to se separate the uses on a, on a property. So this is, I think this is the only way forward uh, for this garage to operate uh, uh, legally. Yeah, you know, when, is, when is this going to be potentially advertised? Uh, well, uh, at the earliest it would be September, but I'll look and see, make sure we have everything filed with the health department and all that. It, it, I mean, August, joint hearing, but it could be deferred to September. So if we, we get the neighbors notified and all this stuff and be ready for feedback on that, that's... But, of course, the notice is not going to go out until, you know, it's like right. with the garage day. It's only going to go out that two weeks or so before the hearing. Mm -hmm. With a garage capital of, yeah. of Central can Virginia. I, <laughs> can I just bring up a general thing on that? <clears throat> um, <laughs> this, I mean, what's the... It's the procedure for mailing out these um, notifications to neighbors. How f far, you know, before a work? So there's a, there's a win yep. What's mm -hmm. the radius of people mm -hmm. adjoining properties? There's a window of 21 days before the hearing and five days. So you got you, you can't be. I can't send it out like now, saying we're going to have a you know a hearing in August on this. Yeah. It has to be no, you know, it's 21 days before, not before. No later than five days, so I always send it out the Friday before the uh, the Friday before the Wednesday workshop. Before the Friday uh, before the so Wednesday and it workshop, usually yeah. gets to people on Saturday. Now, if I go any sooner than that, then I'm beyond that 21 days usually because usually there's at least a two week gap. Sometimes even more depending on when that Wednesday workshop falls. So I don't want to send it out too early. Don't want to send it out too late. So yeah, um, you know we. We, we go way above what's required as far as adjacent and adjoining. You know, we go down the street, we go up the street. I mean, we, you know, we, we do a, we, we had someone the other day that asked about something and said, did, did y'all send me a letter? I said, well, here's the affidavit that we sent it, and this is when we sent it. I mean. Um, well, because we still get a lot of complaints about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and I've always said, I think part of it is that, that joint meetings, which is kind of rare. You know, a lot, of, a lot of communities don't do the joint meetings, so you're not doing it two weeks before the first planning commission, having a planning commission, then sending it out again before the board the next month. So you, it is kind of compact because it's just the joint hearings, uh, which I like to join hearings fine, but I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the criticisms is that people get that first notice, say 15, two weeks before, like, hey, I didn't know about this. Well, I really can't send you that letter until, until, the, until we have that time frame. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, I send invoices all the time, and people don't get them, apparently. So, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously some of the stuff gets thrown yeah, we, away. We have noticed that, too. That you know, yeah, out. some of it's people just don't even look at it. And right. Like, I get all that, but I just it sounds like you have a procedure, which is good. I appreciate that. If, you know, you know some point it wants to be looked at and right. see if it could be improved. But yeah, it sounds like I mean, doing I, good between anyway. broadcasting the meetings, what we, what we have, you know, again, 20 years ago, we had these tools to put things online, to packets online I think you know if you want to look but you know most folks just you know, unless it's in their backyard maybe don't have as much interest and nothing wrong with that but okay thank right. you okay. we have a question on for that I believe all right what do you have next then? okay uh, this is building together William Camden and Jerry Ward how you doing uh, this is a property that I've driven by a lot and always had a lot of interest in what was going on there. <laughs> <laughs> and I think some people will recognize it um, on 29. Let me just get the tax map number here. So they recently purchased this property. It, uh, I think it was an antique store for quite a while. And a single family residence. And I'll just show you the pictures from the packet, and there should. <coughs> I 
so this is this is the front. This was the antique store. This is the, the building. Uh, this is the single family home. Um, they are simply seeking to a special use permit for I think what they call a small scale office. So it be it would be an, just utilize these two buildings as as in A one. There's a office as a special use permit. So utilizing uh, these for for offices. Um, there would need to be, you know, Jamie would inspect the building. It, it depend, you know, if it's an <coughs> office from what it's being used right now, there'd probably have to be uh, exit signs, a few things in order to meet the code, um, the building code. I uh, know the owners weren't aware where the septic uh, was at, uh, and I think y'all had that inspected and looked at recently, maybe. Uh, so we need to get a little more details on the septic. Um, it's... I don't believe there are any records with the health department. There are no records. But y'all did have it recently pumped out and everything, and we'll try to get a report on that. Um, but a small-scale office would be no more than three employees in each building. Um, that's a, you know, it's, it's obviously kind of a downsize from a single-family home and an antique store. Uh, so I think we probably could use more office space. So that is the the plan to get a few more details together uh, and it looks like we probably could move forward with this uh, in August. Um, any, anything you want to add to owners? I know y'all recently purchased it or anything to shed on the light on this or We'll be brief. I know it's been a long night, but um, for example, one of the immediate oh, yeah, uses is I have a marketing and communications consultancy that I'm, I'm doing, so that's what one of the offices could be used for. And, um, and, and we just work, and then I also run some rentals um, elsewhere in the county, so we would sort of manage those out of that business, out of that property, and, and send them on sale. So. We live in Madison. No questions or anything? This, this site would be instead of having a house and an office and a business, it will now, now just become a business. Both doors will be used for that whole property, which actually is a nice change. You're getting closer to agreeing to the A1 standards rather than getting further away. <laughs> and this is A1. non-compliance situation will become more compliant. I think so. Yeah. Any other comment or question on this? Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll just go on to the next one, Zari. Right. Yeah. Okay. Unless we have public comment. <sighs> Oak Grove, uh, this is a, Mr. Ash on behalf of, Al Ash on behalf of Oak Grove Mennonite Church has submitted a site plan for a private school facility. And I will just show you, um, we'll just go to the site plan. I don't know why I put this in here, but I did, but... Um, just the first thing, if you look at the parcel on GIS, it is not updated. Brian was actually going to put this in, Brian Daniel. Uh, they did do a advantage on adjustment of 13 acres with an adjoining property. So this is the, the boundaries of the property. The church would be, if you look at my mouse here, is right in this area. This expansion comes down into this area. Um, uh, they have, you know, it, it will require, and I believe, Al, you have submitted this to DEQ already? Yes. Okay, so they've got all that in the hopper. Um, you can see here is Tom Johnston Road, and this is the existing uh, church and school. This would be the expansion. 
parking um, right here. Uh, there'd be a gym and a, and a school building. I think we said 19,000 square foot expansion. Um, so this would be for the site plan. Uh, and got to get the septic documents. I do have all, all those. That you've sent, that's already been sent to the health department, has it? No, it hasn't been sent to the health department yet. Okay. Okay. And it's up there in the, on the record, like I said, the up, upper left corner is where it's, it's all there. Oh, right here. Yeah. So this, this is actually attached to the existing structures as a breezeway, is that where? Probably worth noting on there that we are going to um, submit about seven acres of that as part of our DEQ plan will be in a conservation easement uh, as well. So that, that was part of our reason for purchasing uh, that much land was that we could uh, put a healthy portion of it into a conservation easement. So we'll get everything to the health department and that DEQ plan is in. Uh, so um, I, I don't know if y'all have some architectural visuals maybe you could share. Not yet. We're working okay. So w w another one of these things, we'll kind of wait and see where we are another month. It could be in August or September. Um, I, I would say right now. Uh, we'll either, either, we may go to September. Right. We'll just, I want to, you know, obviously provide as much information and have it, you know, have the review items, um, if not done, close to done. What is this zone? This, this is A1. There, there is an existing school there that's been there for a long time. says, if you slide it down a little bit, uh, Lee, in there where it says existing structures, where structures, where the word structures is, uh, we would anticipate sometime in the future to take that building and remove that there, where our current school is located at. Have any question on that? Got the checklist all checked. <laughs> it's a good thing. The the conservation easement area. Can you point out where that would be? Yeah, if you I'm just um, curious. Okay, so come on down a little bit more, Lee. That that page right there, you don't quite have the full page right. on, but if you'll look, um, it goes around the drain field and then it goes around that outside edge of the ball field, and then that whole entire corner um, is to the to the left. That seven, oh yeah, all of that area right there is right <coughs> in the conservation easement. Yeah. Legan, this, this would probably let him go. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that that area that moves goes back in there, or part yeah, of it. Yeah, and it's pretty well just a holler down through there anyway. Yeah. It's not uh, very valuable for for anything, and it did help us significantly with our DEQ stuff to offset our. <laughs> Anyone have any other questions? Thank you. Do you have another one, Lee? Yes, sir. So 
Mr. Ash is back. Country View Homes is applied to subdivide an existing R1 residential A1 split zone property. And that's this property right here. Uh, you can look at the zoning on the property. Um, we will show you here. So this is a buy right subdivision. And if you notice the what's in the packet, uh, he's showing a, a drive along the northern sort of edge here. Oh, so here is Ridgeview Road showing a drive. It would serve six of the lots and then the one that remained at the very rear, uh, which is split zone would be, this would be four acres. All the rest of them are between, I think that one nine and 2.2 acres. Uh, this one would be served um, by uh, off the existing, I'm sorry, what that is called, um, old home place. So, where did my browser go here? So that that is, uh, you know, a by right. Uh, he'd have to do a, a stormwater plan, DEQ for this disturbance. Um, there's a, there is an existing, what is, let me just go to this tax map number here. What, which 49, hang on, I might have put in the wrong, 4969B. That's Oak Grove, I put it in the wrong, okay, it's uh, 3238, okay, let me try this again. I know we talked about this a little bit uh, a while ago. Um, one of the things with Mr. Ash we talked about, and one of the things that maybe could consider is you have a drive here, and I did I did take a, a drive down this, and it's a pretty substantial drive. And I'll, I think I, I put some pictures. I didn't put any pictures on here. One of the things I'd like to consider, and I don't think this has to be decided tonight, is that Mr. Ash, from a land disturbance perspective, uh, I think, and from a safety perspective, quite quite honestly, um, it, is that if this, and I know, like I said, I know we had talked about this a little bit, is this would, right along here, would be what he's, what's showing on the plats. It's just bringing this along here, except for this parcel in the rear, this would be served, so you'd have six just straight down here, uh, you know, this new lane. Um, you know, my feeling is, is that there are many, many reasons why uh, having these parcels, say one, two, three, four, five, share this would be ideal. One, lack of disturbance. Um, you already have an existing drive. It's a little bit of a rare, uh, you know, situation where you have an existing drive. You have an R1 property. Uh, I was just something that we consider this 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 layout. And as I have pointed out, the Code of Virginia, even though we haven't adopted this in our ordinance, does allow for deviations from site site plans. And of course, this would all have a maintenance agreement. Uh, would 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 maintain the whole length of it, or just the portion? Just the portion right, but you know, at least the the folks who live in the rear, <coughs> behind, the, the couple couple properties that use that rear, uh, would have this portion totally maintained. Um, uh, my feeling is, it's from you know safety, from a development standpoint, it just sort of makes uh, sense. It's it's kind of a rare case, and I just pointed out where the state code does allow. Um, I gave you the section here uh, for some deviation. Uh, if you have just a good, you know, I think a justifiable reason, uh, <coughs> an injustice, a hardship. I mean, that's whether it's an injustice or a hardship. I, I, I do believe it just, um, you know, one from a safety perspective, two from the sense that you will be disturbing quite a substantial bit, a bit more land from environmental. <coughs> Perspective. This is just to me a all-around uh, justifiable. Um, so, again, 
can definitely uh, develop it uh, per the code, but uh, I sort of like the idea of being able to look at something and when there, there is a, 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 a justifiable reason to sort of deviate, and again, being that there is a road there, it'd be less disturbance, it would be, it would even be less disturbance for the folks who live on the side here. Um, you would have two come in right here. Uh, so if that's just something, again, don't think this is a huge rush. It could be, you know, later this summer or early fall that we get everything in. Um, but just something I'd like, like for the Planning Commission and Board to consider as an option. And the next case is very, This I guess the next case is not a formal, it's just very uh, kind of the same issue I'll talk about. And I think that's more of a safety issue, uh, even more so. But and again, and just showing you again that route coming here. So, any, any thoughts on that? Or uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. it's, this is uh, R1 slash A1. And if I'm with residue, it's going to be still considered a split zone. What exactly is, how does this thing exist? How does it exist? It's an existing R1 slash A1 mm -hmm. park. Is all of it R1, part of it R1? I mean, yeah, so the yellow is the R1 right here. So this last piece is okay. four, four some acres they're showing on the survey. So they're showing four acres, of the ver and the rest of them are, you know, meet the, in R1 on septic, it has to be an acre and a half at minimum. So all the other six lots are being shown as uh, you know 1.8 to 2.2. I think there are three 2.2, three 1.8, and then a four point. So that, that that residue is just a little bit more than that triangle up in the corner. Well, it's actually <coughs> going to be it's 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 yeah it's it's definitely it's kind of goes. Um, yeah, they square, squared it off. Almost. Right. I mean it's. Fairly substantial. Well, that's one of the things that uh, the reason I, I, I would have asked for a rezoning for that portion, but it meets the requirement of an A1. Of yeah, an A1. so it's only two acres. So it was like, yeah, why bother? So that, yeah. was, that was kind of the thought process there. And there's a hollow runs down through there about where it says tax map 32. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a creek that runs down, but it, and it's not, it's just. And that that residue already has a, an access from the, this other from little, old home place yes, lane. Yeah. yeah. And these other lots will be accessed from the new one. Yeah, and, that, and that's yeah. that's really one of the one of the main discussions that I would like to have tonight. I would like to take those two front lots there um, and take those out up there at Ridgeview where I'm showing on this. This is the preferred one. I, I, I submitted the plan per the code uh -huh. and per the requirements. And one of the things that I have here is, is an old uh, deed from uh, back in the day where the Carpenter family that owned this piece of property that I purchased it from, uh, they gave land to make old home place lane. And the reason that they gave that was so that in the future that they could do what they want to do with the land. Mm -hmm. And so that was part of my argument, too, to, to ask if we couldn't bring those other lots off of there. The O'Reilly's uh, live, if, if, you look at the, if you look at that first lot um, higher up than, than my land, that first little narrow <coughs> sort of lot, that's uh, the Dodsons live there. And then that L-shaped piece... Um, come over to the 1151 there. Um, uh -huh. Right there. Yeah, the O'Reilly's own that right there. And they, they were, they go, that road would go right past the back of their house. And they were concerned about, they would like to purchase lot three from me um, so that nobody <coughs> builds there. And, and then then if lot three would be connected to theirs, which would be that uh, 1.91 acre piece, then we could take those two, two first lots, go off on Ridgeview, and then take the last four and come off on Old Home Place Lane. And I met with VDOT out there, and the site is much better 
down here at Old Home Place Lane than it is up there at the other end of the property. And they would prefer that we use Old Home Place Lane, but it w I knew it was not something that we could, I didn't submit anything to VDOT because I wanted to first have this meeting here tonight to discuss with y'all if it's something that you would consider. Um, and then I would develop a plan according, accordingly. But I think there's, I think there would be justifiable reasons to grandfather this in, particularly with the carpenters having given land to the people in the back to make that right of way bigger than what it used to be um, a long time ago. And there's, there's just, there's language in the deed here and everything too that there was an agreement between them and the people in the back to maintain it, keep the culverts up, keep the ditches up. Um, you know, it was a road maintenance agreement <coughs> per se for the time that they lived in. It's a little different than what we use today, but it it was still, they had agreed to help each other maintain the road. How, how many other, is it just one additional parcel at that old home place lane? No, I, it goes back in there like a three-quarter mile or something, and there's, um, if you'll look up there what Legan has, there's... A, Blackie Watson lives back there. Uh, Mike Seal. There's, there's I think like the, four or five others. I back think there. they're just three that you. Well, yeah, I think there are three that use it. Uh, that's the way right. I can tell. Yeah. So it's already serving those three. I'm sorry. This one right here. One, two, three, four. Four, four already yeah. serve. So it goes, it goes way on back in there. And it's just been. It's just one of those roads that have been there. Yeah, my only suggestion is that it still wouldn't jive with the subdivision ordinance, but I think there's, I, I think it's a rare case, um, and I think it's a justifiable that you make that, and that's why I just would recommend that if you were, that you would, that maybe in our subdivision ordinance we adopt that section of the Virginia Code that allows for these kind of rare cases to be considered, uh, what, you know, if you have to make a deviation, because I mean, the code obviously understands when you're, when you're, you know, these type of situations or sometimes it, you know, you get on, get on the ground and you look at the way things lay out, it just, it, it makes sense that this um, existing road in this case uh, potentially be used as an access to more than maybe than we intended in the subdivision ordinance. Somebody saying, well, why can't, why can't we have seven or why can't we have eight? And, you know, put it at six. And I, and I, and I, think, I, th I think my response to that partially, Steve, would be this, that it, it's one thing if I'm bringing a new subdivision on a 30-acre parcel that I'm going to uh, open up for a subdivision or if it's something that's been existing for a long time. That would kind of be where I would come with that. My other answer is, does common sense, is that legal? No. <laughs> to use common sense. Common sense is no longer legal. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> it's been years. <laughs> and I think that was it. That's, that's the word. That's, <laughs> but, I, I mean, yeah, you, you want to be careful with these because, yeah. you know, there, there are situations uh, that, 
you know, we want to, you know, if this is the route that the Planning Commission Board uh, want to adopt or, or from the code, then, you know, I think you, you need to have a, a justifiable reason. Uh, and, and, you know, just looking at this on its face, I think you would. Um, We don't have any public left, so. <laughs> right, we'll just keep, yeah. Yeah, someone said we had a long meeting, so we haven't even got going yet. <laughs> and, and I guess, I guess I'll guess i just wait to hear from, to, we'll go to our July meeting, and, 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 that's, and, and that's when we talk about it some more, I, that I should be prepared to talk about it some more. Okay, thank you very much. We can do some deed, you know, let Sean and Hannon look at yeah. the deeds and maybe determine and, and, if. And, and I, uh, I use Steve Will. transactions and I'd be more than happy to he, he researched all this and everything and uh, be more than happy to share any of that with anybody that you'd like to that'd be welcome and Thank so I think sir. I think just so we're all clear there's two different issues there which is the the easement piece and then whether or not we want to actually amend the ordinance to allow for that hardship ability to create an exception so two different issues there Yep. Thank you. Okay. Any other additional review or so I'll, items? I'll do it. Th this would this kind of dovetails into this, and the app, the the owners were were here, but they left. Told them to come back a little later, but they didn't come back. So um, if they wanted to, they could stay. But you might recall this property. Uh, this is uh, Heben Church Valley Road on the corner. It was actually for auction, I don't know, six months ago. And this is, it was really strange because we had a lot of calls about it and I don't know if the deeds or the what was shown on record, people had some questions. They knew it was 30 acres. They didn't totally know. It was just some confusion around how this 30 acres was more or less subdivided. We're showing this. And I have talked to Brian about this, but when the survey was recently done, um, this is what came out. So we have an existing house here. We have another parcel here. Par I would just you know, we call this parcel one. Uh, we have a <coughs> sorry, 13 acres. We have 9.3 acres. Parcel two, 4.8 acres. Parcel four, 2.6 acres. So the, the applicant wants to subdivide. And, I, and, I, and I'll just show you right here, this would be the subdivision, right, again, kind of a quirky, you know, a situation where you have a survey and this is what it shows. Um, compared, they knew they bought 30 acres, but it's about all they knew. So if you look at, from a subdivision perspective, you just look at what you can create with nine at A1, you got two and a residue, three. Um, here, three new, three acres, three plus acres, and a, and a residue. So if you got what that looks like to me, um, three, you know, uh, seven, eight, nine, <coughs> these two wouldn't be able to be subdivided, these two right here. You have two entrances, you have one here to the property. And I'll just come here and show you. You've got an entrance here. Oh, don't want to go too big. You've got an entrance right here. You've got an entrance here, like a farm entrance. You got an existing entrance uh, that goes to this house here. And you got a potential entrance here, here. Not preferred by the VDOT because it's in a curve. Uh, here could simply just do a subdivision where you do six on one road, you do, I don't know, three on one road, and you just straight in, straight out, straight in, straight out. But we're talking to VDOT. We had a conference call on this particular one. This is supposed to be a cul-de-sac. I turned around. I turned around here. Instead of having a situation where you have you know, these three lots or whatever 
go here, these six lots go here, is just simply connecting this. It'd be a privately maintained road. It would be connected this way. The traffic, the cars from here could disperse to either to either um, exit or, or come in at either entrance. That is preferred uh, as opposed to um, just doing one, you know, sort of like a little similar to the last situation. Uh, but what's really kind of odd about this is the fact that you have a, you know, you had a survey that was done that shows a total con different configuration. The, the, this is just a rough sketch of what it may lay out. And it can be achieved just by doing a road in, doing a road in, not connecting them. But I, from a planning perspective, having those two roads back up to each other and not allowing the, the residents to move to go to either either direction. Now, you're only going to go, well, when you come out, you're only going to be able to go this direction. You, know, you can only go to the, to the right, south. There's no crossover there. Yeah, there, there is no crossover. So the, the when I talked to the land use specialists at VDOT, they, they prefer this. They, they, they think the connection is a good idea with the understanding that's a sub, you know, a local subdivision ordinance uh, type thing. But c connecting these together uh, would be a, an ideal uh, they could use either e either outlet or, 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 or any other property from either one as, as well. Um, so again, maybe something that kind of kind of ties into the last conversation, even though I just told you it's rare. <laughs> it, it really is. I, I really, and th these are two totally unique situations that I haven't seen. Uh, and it, it took a while to get this surveyed, um, as you can see. I do believe this would need to be recorded before they come. And this is not in any rush. But it's just, just want to kind of put it on your radar. Um, and really the, the big, kind of, com to me, common sense sort of thing would be if this could be one unified private road with, with the access, uh, to, with the ability to access either entrance exit. So this is adding four more lots, though, right? What's that? This is adding four more? There's four, there's four existing. Right, right. so right, right now existing. there's, right, there's four so existing. Four more. Mm-hmm. That's right. So it would be a total of, and this is a very rough kind of idea. So you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is three, this is four, so this is seven, eight, nine. So these two are existing right here. Oh yes, there there would all be building. Everything would be over three acres. Now this one right here is not this one right here, but that's already on record. That's been on record for well well before subdivision ordinance. This this survey Gega went back decades to dig this up. I I think my understanding is it was on. It's been a even though it was, it's inaccurate on our GIS, this has been on record before we even had a subdivision ordinance. It just wasn't properly recorded. Um, and we, we, I can get more details. And, but this is what the surveyor, when he went to the courthouse, this is what, how it lays. So, this is, this is That's right. With the, the proposed two entrances, are they to 900 feet apart, or are they? I, I can't tell. There's no scale. Uh, you know, I, I believe it is right at. Where it says no name road, is that actually Hugan Valley Road? Right? Yeah, it's. I think I remember measuring it. It's. It's like literally like 950 feet between the two entrances. Okay. Lincoln, going back to the other. What? The other picture. The one that had parcel four. Is there a building on that now? 
or no? Let's see here. Uh, I'm going to figure this. Get this. So the right parcel two has the existing. But parcel four has, has doesn't have anything on it. And it's but it's that's less than three acres. Yes, but it's been on record from far as I can tell for many many years. So we would consider it a, a buildable. It's unique, you know, that, that's kind of a, when, when people were calling about it, when we were doing research, we were like, you're just going to have to get a surveyor and so on. Yeah. 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 Right there at the bridge. Yeah. There's the entrance right there. Well, that that's another reason why having a you know an alternate exit would be would be advisable. So basically. Basically, if, if we're we're gonna, with if you've got two entrances, even if you connect the roads together, we can pretend like it's two roads. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I think it's just one of these situations that if it come in, if if we had that provision, uh, I mean, health, safety, and welfare, I think it's 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 well justifiable, really in both cases, um, and it gives the flexibility uh, to look at. These situations and when it, when it makes sense. Both of them are, fairly, like I said, fairly rare situations. Um, but so, Ligon, are you proposing that this would fall in that six, you know, dwellings on a private drive, or this would? Yeah, be that's designed? that's my whole. That's the whole thing. Is that if this is, I mean, if you just backed them up to each other, didn't connect them, you could say, hey, we're we're not doing, you know, we're we're meeting the subdivision, but mm -hmm. I think it. I think it's not one. It's from a safety perspective, from practicality, from a common sense. I agree yeah, yeah. entirely. Right, 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 right. The problem is we've got two situations tonight that I agree with the common sense factor of that contradicts something that we just put in place like six months ago. Right, but I, I think that's why the code of Virginia has that provision, as understands that, especially in you know rural areas where you <coughs> always kind of call it the jigsaw puzzle. You're trying to put together, and you got roads and. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's a certain amount of setting for some precedents, too. Sure, but I think you want to make sure it meets certain criteria. Um, and just, you know, my humble opinion, I think these two would would meet the criteria that I would want to apply for something uh, that you would make an exception for. I, again, I'm kind of with you on that. Yeah. But it's just, you know, there's some concerns for that. We're just not allowed to use common sense. That's <laughs> Well, I always make the, you know I always kind of make the term that you know, as far as the ordinances go, it's ultimately, right. you know, ultimately, yeah, six, eight, or nine. yeah. but ultimately, uh, you you know, the planning commission, the board controls what's in it, and it's 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 okay to amend it, especially in my humble opinion, for something that kind of uh, from a safety perspective and those other things would. Well, for one, you got to do it for all those. Yeah, I, I think you'd have to meet certain. I guess I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't overthink it too much, but I think these two, two situations would, in my years of seeing Platts and administrative, I've just kind of rare, but it does happen. Yeah, no, I, 
if, if something comes up that I'm aware of that needs to look into the deed or an ownership issue or like a right away, you know, we, I mean, I can access it from my computer pretty easily. Uh, but sure, I mean, I, I don't, I don't. If it's something that needs a little more investigation, I don't mind putting it in the packet. You know. But, but so like the campground, you know, I didn't include the deed, but I went and looked at the deeds for the, you know, the one and just made sure that, oh, and looked at the survey. Yeah, right, right, right. You know, usually for the larger, more complicated ones, but I mean, this, even smaller ones can be complicated sometimes. Anything else, Dave? Do we have anything to add from the planning committee? Can we have a motion? Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you.